Welcome to episode 4 of the Stoneworks Lua tutorials. In the last episode, we added touch controls to the fuel tank example and finished it up. Now, let's learn some more about tables and make a vehicle tracker using a map and a fancy table. First though, there is one more input option in Stoneworks, the properties of a microcontroller. There is property.getText, getNumber, and getBool. These allow you to reference property values in a microcontroller without actually connecting them to the Lua script. These can be very helpful for data that only needs to change in the vehicle editor. Make sure when you're using the property inputs, you spell the label of the property exactly how it appears in the microcontroller. Here is an example where we can receive the text hello from the property labeled message. In Stormworks, there is a limit on the max amount of characters that can be in your script, and that number is 4096. Lowering your character count while keeping the code understandable is a large problem that really only affects more complex scripts. A good way to often lower your character count is to use tables. But if that fails you, you can use the minifier in the online IDE to greatly lower the character count in your script. But back to tables. In previous episodes, I have briefly mentioned tables and we used them in the fuel tank example script to store the bool values for our fuel pumps. Now let's get a bit more in depth. To help me explain tables, let's say you were wanting to store the x and y coordinates of multiple points in tables. Now, tables don't have to just be a long list of data. They can be cool, multi-dimensional lists of data. Now, although multi-dimensional sounds complex and scary, they aren't the rocket science that they sound like, and all it means is that you have a table within a table. So say you want to store the x and y coordinates of some points inside a table called points. Using a two-dimensional table, we can make a table called points, and within our table points, we can add two more curly brackets and specify our x and y values separated by a comma. Then, when adding more points, you just separate two more curly brackets by a comma and put in your new x and y values, again separated by a comma. So now we have two tables with two values contained inside a table called points. Tables can store multiple values, and in order to keep track of these values, it indexes them using keys. So every value added is paired to a key, like this. You can also specify your own keys when adding objects to a table by saying something like this, where your key, say x, equals your value. So now you can refer to this value by saying my table dot x. So let's look at our two dimensional table from earlier and modify it a bit so that we use custom keys x and y for our x and y values we are storing. These square brackets are used to select certain key value pairs from tables using keys. However, you can't use your custom keys when doing this. You will have to either just stick to the default numbering of keys, or you'll have to specifically request that key. You can combine usages though. Again, using our coordinates example, let's say we want the x value from the second point. Then we would write points, left square bracket, two, right square bracket, and then dot x. So now we have the x value from the second point. Now what if we want to add coordinates to our points table on the fly while the code is running and not predefine them in the table? Well, we can use the table library. Using table.insert, we can insert values into tables. The first argument is the name of the table, and the second argument is the value you are adding. That value can just be a normal number or bool, or it could be another table, or another table with custom keys. You can also insert custom key values, but you don't use table.insert, rather, you just set its value like points.x equals 1. Of course, we can also remove data from a table using table.remove. The first argument is again the table you want to remove from, but the second argument is the key that you want to remove. So you can select the numbered key when not using custom keys. If you are using custom keys, then you'll just have to set that value to nil, like how we set the value earlier. There are only a few map functions, but they can be used to make very useful GPS systems in-game. Now, this is where terminology can get confusing, so I'm going to call an in-game world coordinate value a world x or world y, and then a screen coordinate value will be screen x or screen y. Now, this first function technically belongs in the screen library because it is called using screen.drawMap, but it involves the map, so I've included it in this map video instead. Now, this function has only three arguments, the world x, world y, and then the zoom level from 0.1 to 50, with 50 being the most zoomed out and 0.1 being the most zoomed in. 
And here is a list of functions that set the colors of different layers on the map using RGBA values. The alpha value is again optional. These functions are again called using the screen library, but they too fit better in this map video. Using these, you can color the various map layers wherever you see fit. This function will convert a screen X and a screen Y into real world coordinates using the maps X, Y, zoom, screen width and height, and then the screen X and screen Y. This function is the opposite of the last. It takes a real world coordinate point and converts it into a point on the screen. It requires the maps X, Y, zoom, the screen width and height, and then the world X and Y. Now let's take a look at the example script for this video. At the top you'll notice we have a touch function here, and the math is similar to the touch function from the last video, however, this one allows us to discern between if the player is touching with one key, or both keys, or which key they're touching with. Then we have my favorite function, the clamp function, and then we have the calculate distance function, and then on tick, there's the usual get width and height of the screen. And then I get bool 3 and set that to track. Track is whether or not we're plotting points. The sample rate, I get that from a property called ticks per sample. And then if time, which increases every tick, if track is true, if time is greater than or equal to the sample rate, then I insert the current x and y into the points table. And then if the number of points in the points table is greater than 1, because obviously you can't measure the distance between no point and the first point, then it measures the distance between the last point and the current point. It then sets the time to 0 to restart it all. Then I have the generic press equals input dot get bool. Then I have these if statements that check if the player is pressing, and then there's further if statements to see where they're pressing. And that is for the controls for zooming in, zooming out, recentering the view, and then moving up, down, left, and right on the map. You'll notice for center view, it says follow equals true. And then just below these if statements, it says if follow, then map x equals, and that's the current x, and map y equals, and that's the current y. So that way it follows the vehicle's GPS. Then in on draw, you can see I get the width and height of the screen. And then I call draw map using the map x, y, and zoom. This for loop is what draws lines on the screen for all the points in the points table. You can see here there's px, py, and then px2 and py2. And these are just getting the first point and then the point previous to that point. And then it draws a line between them. And if the zoom is less than 0.5, then I start drawing the distance between the points on the map. You can see I have this variable distance between, which is, well, the distance between the current point and the last point in the table. And if the distance between them is greater than 20, then I draw the text on the screen. Then after that, I draw the points. So I loop through the entire points table, get the X and Y of the point on the screen, and then draw a circle there. You'll notice I draw the points after I draw the lines. And that's so the points show up above the lines, and the lines are under the points. Then I have an if statement that says if there's more than one point in the table, it draws a text box of the total distance you've traveled by the latest point. Then I have some simple buttons for zooming in, zooming out, and resetting the view to focus on the player. And that's all there is for this script. I encourage you to load this one into Stormworks and into the online IDE to check out how it works. While it is a bit complicated to use a 2D table, I think it's a very important thing to learn. So make sure you understand everything that's going on here. Thank you for watching the Lua tutorial series. Originally, I had only planned to do these four tutorials, but now that Server Lua has come out, I plan on adding those to the playlist in the future. So look forward to those coming out in the near future.